Hey, this is Mr. Leach with Simpson Math, and today we are going to be talking about the co-functions, sine and cosine. You should have this GeoGebra document available to you. We created it in the last video. If you haven't done that yet or don't have a copy of the video, make sure to watch the previous video and follow those steps. Okay, so now we're ready to talk about the sine function. Notice as I change alpha, that orange dot is going to follow along. So we're going to be talking about that dot a little bit. So let's move alpha to zero. Why, when alpha is zero, is sine zero? Well, again, what is sine? If you, so if you hover over sine, it says that sine is the y value of b prime divided by the radius. Well, the radius is always one, so really, in this case, sine is always just the y value. If the radius wasn't one, it's going to be the ratio between the y over the radius but it's going to be the same value as if the radius was 1. So the y value for b prime is 0, so that means sine is 0. Let's increase alpha to 30 degrees. Now, why 30 degrees? By the way, you can use the arrow keys to make small steps on that slider. So why 30 degrees? Well, we're going to be talking about 30 degrees, or pi sixth. Then we'll be talking about 45 degrees, or pi fourths. And then 60 degrees, or pi thirds. Those three angles come from two of our special right triangles. You might recall from geometry the 30, 60, 90 right triangle. And you might also recall the 45, 45, 90 right triangle. Both of those triangles have easy radian measurements, pi thirds, pi fourths, pi sixths. And when working with those special right triangles, and given only one of the sides, you can actually calculate the other two. So in this case, since we always know what the radius is, 1, when the angle is 30, 45, or 60, I know exactly what the other two legs are. So at 30 degrees, if you notice, b prime is 0.5. It's precisely half of 1. So this orange length, if I was to swing this over to that hypotenuse, is actually half of that hypotenuse when the angle here is 30 degrees. That's kind of cool. Let's increase this to 45 degrees. Notice as I increased it to 45, D moved over to the right a little bit and also moved up. Um, this D is the same height as this value because my radius is 1 right now. If I increase the radius, notice D doesn't move, but that height of that triangle sure does. That's again why we use our unit circle with a radius of 1. So here I have a value of 0.707 or square root of 2 over 2. If I increase alpha to 60, we get 0.86603, or square root of 3 over 2. Now let's move on to 90. Notice what's happening at 90 degrees. Yeah, we have a sine of 1. That's because our y value is 1, and so is the radius. Here, the radius and the y value are the exact same thing, so 1 over 1 is just 1. Now, what do you think is going to happen as we increase alpha and move into the second quadrant? Remember, this is the first quadrant, second quadrant, third quadrant, fourth quadrant. What's going to happen? Is it going to keep increasing or is it going to decrease? Yeah, it starts decreasing. So at sine of 120 degrees, we get 0.86603. That number sounds familiar, doesn't it? That 0.86603 is an approximation for square root of 3 over 2, which is the exact same thing that we saw when we saw sine of 60 degrees. That's not a coincidence. The reason for that is because our reference angle, which in your pre-calc classes is actually called alpha, we have a reference angle right here, if I click B, A, C, is 60 degrees. The reason for that, this is a straight angle right here, from the 0 to 180 degrees, or this pi radians. So that means that these two angles have to add up to 180 degrees or have to add up to pi. And it does. This angle measurement right here is still 60. So from your geometry classes back in the day, if I just gave you this right triangle and told you this was 60 degrees and asked you what is sine, it would be this y value over that radius. This y value is the same height whether it is in the second quadrant or in the first quadrant. I'm going to undo and get rid of that angle. Before we move on from 120, our orange dot is about out of view. So I'm actually going to zoom out a little bit and adjust the screen. I'm going to zoom out until I see 2 pi. 
and can still see all my circle. All right, that's perfect. So let's move our alpha up a little bit. So when alpha is 135, that's the same thing when my angle was 45. When I increase my angle to 150, that's the same thing we saw when it was 30. Notice it keeps decreasing, decreasing. What's gonna happen whenever we get to 180 degrees or pi? Yeah, we get back to zero. So follow this alpha as it go back to zero. But you notice what's happened. It was increasing in the first quadrant till it reached a peak of one, and then now it's decreasing until it's reaching pi. So what do you think is gonna happen once we move past pi or past 180 degrees? Yeah, it's gonna start going negative, isn't it? Hey, why is that? Why is it negative? Well, it's negative because that my y value of b prime is negative. So here, my y value, whenever I'm at 240 degrees, is a negative 0 0.86603, or negative squared root 3 over 2. And this, again, would have that a reference angle of 60 degrees. So let's increase our alpha to 3 pi halves, or 270 degrees. It's at negative 1, and that negative 1 is the lowest point in the graph. So if I increase alpha from here, the output is going to start increasing and moving closer and closer again to the x-axis. Let's take a look at 300. Again, this would be a reference angle of 60 degrees. That's why we see our friendly 0.86603 or square root of 3 over 2, but again, negative. And then eventually, once we get up to 360 degrees, it's going to be at 0. So what I want you to do is move alpha back to almost 0. You need to right-click on it and select Trace On. Okay, I'm going to put it quickly move it back to zero and I'm just going to hold down the right arrow key and let's see what happens. So notice it's increasing. It's not increasing as fast anymore, just maxed out at pi halves. Now it's on its way back down. It's going to cross the x-axis at pi. Now it's negative. It was moving quickly negative, now it's slowed down until it reached a minimum of negative one and now is moving up back towards the x-axis, which is going to cross at 2 pi. That is the sine wave. If GeoGebra were to allow us to extend this slider past 360 degrees and it keep calculating it, we would be able to see that it would increase and then decrease and then increase and decrease again. And if we were to be able to go into negative degrees, it would go back that way. Well, fortunately, GeoGebra is basically a calculator itself, so let's input our function of just sine of x. So instead of f of x, because our point is d, let's use d of x, so d open parentheses, x close parentheses, so I'm defining d of x to be sine, this is lowercase sin, notice when you type in lowercase sin, GeoGebra goes, oh, I know what that is, um, so I'm going to input just x and hit enter. It colored it green and you can see that it lined up perfectly on that sine wave we just created. If I zoom out, notice our trace goes away, but you should be able to see that this sinusoidal wave goes on forever and ever and ever just following that shape. These type of functions are called periodic because it's going to follow this period of 2 pi and just repeat it over and over and over again forever and ever. Let's color this function d orange so it matches our point and thicken it up. And one last thing, turn off the trace. Anytime you want to get rid of any tracing that happened, just zoom in and out or just wiggle the screen for a second. You should notice now that as I change alpha, the point d is just going to follow around the function sine of x flawlessly. So like I said, we're going to talk about sine and cosine. So let's repeat this process, but this time for cosine. So I'm going to turn off d of x, but let's leave point d visible. Okay, so we need to calculate cosine. So cosine is the ratio of the x value divided by the radius. So let's do the same thing, but this time for cosine. So on the input, let's type in cosine. Notice if I do lowercase cos, GeoGebra knows what that is, so I need to do capital cos, and then let's go ahead and spell it all the way out, so cosine, so in all caps, equals and this time it's going to be the x value of b prime divided by the radius. Hit enter. So here it defined that cosine is 
0.88295 when the angle is 28 degrees. So let's add our point just like we have point D. So let's pick the point tool, click somewhere intentionally away from the other points so that way when we redefine point E, we know what that is. Let's also change this to be red. I picked orange earlier, by the way, because that lines up with our Y value of our triangle, and I'm picking red because that lines up with the X value of our triangle. Double click on E, and let's redefine the X value to be alpha. So just a quick test. As we change alpha, yep, notice E and D are moving together, but E is not changing its Y value because we haven't defined it to be that. Double click on it, and let's change out the Y value to be cosine, all caps. So now as I change alpha around, E is following the output of cosine. Let's break down cosine a little bit. What happens when, when alpha is zero? This time, E is one, because the X value is one, divided by the radius, so cosine is one when alpha is zero. Notice that is drastically different from the sine. Well, what about at 30 degrees? This time at 30 degrees, we can see that 0 0.86603. That's the same number we saw when sine was 60 over and over. That's because these are co-functions. So if you have two complementary angles, so let's say 30 and 60, the sine of one of those angles will always equal the cosine of the other. And that's going to be true for the other co-functions that we'll see in later videos. So if I had the sine of 80 degrees, that will equal the cosine of 10 degrees, and so forth. So here, we see our cosine of 30 degrees is 0 0.86603. Let's move this up to 60 just to test that. The cosine of 60 is 0.5. Remember, that's what the sine of 30 was. Let's back up to 45 degrees. At 45 degrees, why do sine and cosine equal each other? Well, again, they're co-functions. The complementary angle to 45 degrees is 45 degrees, so that's why they equal each other. Also, geometrically, this is an isosceles right triangle. So this orange line and this red line are the same lengths, so the ratio is going to be the same as well. What about when alpha is 90? Well, when alpha is 90, our cosine is zero because x is zero. If you've been following the red dot, what's going to happen when I increase alpha just a little bit? it's going to go negative. Why did it do that? Why is it negative? Well, that's because the x value of b prime is now negative. So here I'm at a negative 0.5. So let's go ahead and turn the trace on, on e, and instead of holding down the arrow key, I'm just gonna move the alpha around a little bit. So it's not gonna be as smooth, but it's gonna get the point across. So notice, we have this decreasing. What's gonna happen when we get to pi? Yeah, that's going to be our minimum value there. And then if we, as we increase, it's going to be moving closer and closer back to the x-axis. And at 270, it crosses the x-axis because, again, x is 0 here, and 0 over 1 is just 0. And if we increase closer and closer to 360, because x is back to 1 over 1. So looking at this, you might think, oh yeah, cosine is, cosine is rather different than sine. So let's graph the function cosine of x. That's point E, so let's do E of x is cosine, lowercase, cos, of x. And there you have it, passes through perfectly. So what we created using the ratio of the x of b prime divided by the radius does match exactly with what GeoGebra will do when you just say calculate the function. Let's change cosine to be red and a little bit thicker. Hey, let's turn on the orange function and then zoom out a bit. Our tracings do go away, but what do you notice about sine and cosine? They are both sinusoidal waves. The cosine is quite literally the sine function just moved left pi halves or 90 degrees. They're both sinusoidal waves. Let's turn off trace on point E and move alpha around and you can see that those points line up perfectly. Notice in this document, the only thing that you can control to move these points around, to move that triangle around, is this alpha slider. If I move the radius, it doesn't change those points. When I move the alpha slider around, that changes the outputs of sine and cosine. 
So what that means is, these trig functions have one input, an angle. And then the output are these ratios. So that's a very important note to make. The input are these angles, this alpha. That's, what, that's why we see the angles on the x-axis. And the output are these ratios. These ratios are similar, but different. They, are, they do complement each other, but they are different. There are four other primary trig functions, and we'll be talking about them in the next videos. But as an extension, if you want to try it out before you watch the video, see if you could apply tangent or cotangent or secant or cosecant to this document, and then check the next video to see how you did. Have fun!